Thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, just bear with me while I share my screen. Right, hopefully you can see that again now. And apologies, I realised I was videoing the, um, showing you a bit of Duplo box before. So hopefully I've got my camera the right way around now. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks for inviting me along tonight. Um, as Verona mentioned, um, originally I was asked to talk about temporary works and lifting, um, something I'm uh, very, very interested in given my role. Um, I decided to widen it out a little bit more and talk about um, cranes in a more broad, broader sense, lifting equipment in a broader sense. And I thought why cranes and loads fall over would probably be quite an interesting topic. So hopefully this works and I can go through the presentation. Here we go. So a bit about Costain. Um, we work in lots of different sectors I and mean, we do a bit of, bit of we do construction we do consultancy we do we do digital um as you can see we've been around for quite a long time so we've been around since 1865 predominantly we work in natural resources so water energy um we've got lots of work on um, hs2 so we do rail we do highways we do, we do all sorts currently about three thousand employees and we turn over around about a billion pounds a year so pretty pretty big company um my role at costain and about me i've been there for 18 years now um so i'm a chartered civil engineer like verona said and um, a fellow of the ice current role is as chief engineer so designated individual for lifting um, i also look after scaffolding that's not my primary interest lifting is where i really come from um outside of the business i sit on seven or eight uh, bsi committees for crane use and design and since last year i've been the chairman of the 7121 committee so the, the uk committee for safe use and testing standards um, some other bits and pieces I've done in the past, so I've written guidance for the Construction Plant Hire Association, AOMI, um, LEAR, and other industry bodies. If you ever have any queries, obviously there are my details, feel free to get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to help with any queries you've got. So thinking about cranes and loads and why they fall over, I suppose the, the first question there is what is stability? Because um, pr primarily we're talking about stability here. Have a quick look at the regulatory requirements about stability, about safe positioning and planning I've taken out, because I thought we might overrun if I do that, so we'll just look at stability only. Um, and then let's have a look at what makes cranes and loads unstable, and of course, what can we do to address that instability? That's the, the primary course for um, getting around these issues. So what is stability? Now, if you look at a dictionary definition, stability is something that's firmly fixed or not likely to move or change. Obviously, if we're talking about lifting, that's not a huge amount of use, because of course, we are moving loads, so that's not going to help us. In terms of engineering, uh, a definition would be something that, a bit of a long-winded one, but if you have a structure and you virtually displace it, so you push something, if you then remove that force from it and it returns to where it was before, then that would be in stable equilibrium. It's a bit long-winded, really, for what we're talking about. So the easiest way of thinking about it in terms of lifting is we're looking for equipment that doesn't turn over, doesn't fall over. So there's lots of forces acting on cranes and the equipment we use, um, we wanted to be able to resist those overturning forces and stay upright as it of course should be. One of the things that is gonna come into that of course is what the equipment is sat on. Now we will generally think about ground conditions with cranes and, and uh, those sorts of things. Of course, that is very, very important. Um, but lifting equipment is obviously broader than just cranes and it could be uh, chain blocks and things suspended from something. So we're also thinking about the steel work potentially that is supporting the equipment and stopping it from falling down. In terms of the loads itself, we don't want loads that are going to rotate of their own accord. So sometimes or frequently we'll pick up loads with cranes and we'll, uh, mainly when we have more than one crane, we'll be deliberately trying to rotate the loads. So that's, that's absolutely fine. That's part of what we're planning to do. But what we don't want them to do is do that of their own accord. And when we put the load down, however, whatever we're doing with it, we put it down, we want to be able to release it from the crane and for it to stay where we put it, for it not to fall over. So stable when loaded is also very, very important. I think probably this group is the, the wrong people to lecture on regulations and standards. So I'll give you a bit of an overview. I've been delivering this this week as well to um, 100 odd people on HS2. So for them, this is not, I wouldn't say news to them, but it's not something they're as familiar with as you guys will be. So obviously at the top of the tree, we've got the Health and Safety at Work Act. That's always always in play. And we're, we, you know, as employee employers, we've got to look after the health, safety and welfare of employees and others affected by our undertakings, which could be, of course, the public so far as it's reasonably practicable. Following on from that, we've got the management regs, as I'm sure you're aware, which will um, cover the same sort of thing, but also bring in the need for risk assessment. Um, then following on from those, in, in relation to lifting now, we've obviously got Lola and Pure. Um, the, some, sometimes there's a bit of confusion in the industry about um, Lola and Pure in terms of 
a sort of belief, if you like, in the industry that if something's Lola, then it isn't pure. And of course, pure is an effect the senior regulation to Lola. So something like a crane is a piece of work equipment, so it falls under pure. Because it is a piece of lifting equipment, it also falls under Lola. So both apply. We've then got things like the work at height regs, obviously accessing cranes, um, rigging cranes involves a lot of working at height. Supply machinery safety regs in terms of things like CE marking, declarations of conformity, that sort of stuff for the time being. Obviously, that changes pretty soon. Um, and then we've also got CDM, PPE, COSH. There's lots of other bits and pieces. So the regulations are as you would expect. Underneath that, we've got the standard sort of standards and guidance structure. Um, we've got the approved code of practice for all the different regulations. And then we've got things like BS 7121, which is the code of practice for safe use of cranes. We've then got industry guidance, which comes from a range of sources, but CPA, the Construction Plant Hire Association, um, LEA, the Lift and Equipment Engineers Association, uh, and other bodies provide lots and lots of detailed guidance. And what we do find is if we're doing something, say, planning lifting with an excavator, we can use the approaches which are laid out in 7121 in terms of planning and in terms of management, but we'd have to look at the CPA guidance to get the detail on the equipment that we're going to use. So load of regulation for this is the only bit of regulation I'm going to talk about really strength and stability. And as I'm sure you're aware, the, the regulations in the UK are quite brief, which is fine, but it leaves them it means you've got to interpret what they mean, really. So lifting equipment must be of adequate strength and stability for each load. Sounds straightforward. Sounds like an obvious intention. Um, from the approved code of practice, then, we get a bit more information there. It's got to be of adequate strength and capacity for the load and the accessories. And the accessories, in this case, will include the chains, the shackles, all those sorts of things you're thinking about, but will also include the hook block, the rope hanging off the end of the crane, all those sorts of things. They're all accessories, in effect. Think about the configuration of the equipment and the effect that that has on the capacity. So for a crane, you might be talking about the outrigger positions, the counterweight you've added to it, the amount of rope, um, the boom boom configuration, all these sorts of things. Um, they will have an effect on the capacity, so think about that. Make sure you provide an appropriate margin of safety. We're not talking about the um, design factor of safety. Of course, cranes don't get to 100% um, capacity and then fall over. But what you wouldn't really want to be doing is using crane to at 100% of capacity. That'd be a little bit, um, uh, I wouldn't say dangerous. It's, of course, within the capacity of the machine, but you need to allow a little bit of flexibility for the things that you can't necessarily control. You need to prevent overload, and that can be through a range of different things. So indicators and limiters. It sounds pretty obvious, but there's a, there's a fundamental difference. And the easiest way of explaining this is by way of something like a mobile crane versus an excavator that's being used for lifting. Um, excavators will indicate to the operator that they are approaching an overload situation. But generally, unless you've paid the extra bit of money, they will not stop you going into an overload situation and then turning the machine over. That's very different with something like a mobile crane. It will indicate, it will then, as you go beyond the overload, it will then indicate outside the cab. So if people around the cab are aware of what's happening, but it will also limit you. So it will cut the, the actions of the crane apart from to make it more stable. So to bring the load closer in. Um, audible and visual warnings. Obviously, it's pretty pretty clear what we're talking about there. Um, think about the use of a crane and the stability, but also don't forget that you've got to assemble the crane many times and you might have to dismantle it as well. So there have been quite a few incidents over the years with things like tower cranes um, falling over during the assembly or dismantling stages. So don't, don't overlook those. Make sure you use the support equipment as required. So things like outriggers, um, stabilizers on lorry loader cranes, and think about what you're supporting the crane on or indeed hanging it from. So that is as much as I was going to talk about the regulations, because I think that those will probably all be pretty obvious. So what I tried to do, I went through um, the instance that we've had within um, Costain over the last three, four, five years, um, and also some of the industry uh, accidents, both in the UK and worldwide, some of the more sort of um, well-known ones, really, and try and explain from a stability perspective what went wrong with each of them. And as I was putting this together, it's quite clear that actually um, human error comes into a lot of this. In fact, uh, the vast majority of these are down to humans. Obviously, those fit into two different camps. There's the, the errors which are made because people have slips of action, lapse of memory, perhaps they apply a rule, which isn't the right rule in that scenario. But actually, uh, more than you would expect are because people have violated safety devices or um, worked outside of the, the lift plan. So it's quite, quite scary, really, and quite sobering. Uh, I, again, this should be pretty obvious, but just how forces act on cranes. There's a number of different forces in play on a crane. Um, in the orange arrow, you can see the dead load of the crane. In the green arrow, you can see the hoisted load, which would include the accessories, as I explained before. 
you then got the dynamic loading from slewing the crane round, jibbing the crane up and down. And then wind acts on the crane in a number of different ways. So on the boom and on the load, and that of course moves, swings the load around, and it can also place undue stresses on the crane structure itself. So there's probably a few too many on the call to sort of ask you to, to call out. But if you think about what makes cranes unstable, um, what fundamentally is going to, going to affect the crane stability? And I came up with a number of different things when I was thinking about this. So those are the things I, I thought could be um, big issues, not been, not been set up correctly, not been, um, not been put together in the right order, if you like, being used beyond its capacity, tricking the safety features that are in place, the so things like the rate of capacity indicator, which if you haven't come across one before, it's effectively the crane's um, computer, which is displayed in the cab, which tells the operator in this configuration um, and at this radius, this is the amount of, uh, this is the load weight you can safely pick up. And they can often be tricked, so it's worth worth knowing that. I'll show you what I mean later. Um, we've got things like safety devices being over, ignored or overridden. That's more really in relation to excavators. That's that's a big issue. Um, not being used as it was designed or as per the, the manufacturer's instructions. Not installed correctly. It's very similar to not set up correctly, but we'll look at both of those. Ground conditions, of course, is a big one. It doesn't have to be a, a static ground condition, though, and we'll look at what happens when you put cranes on things that can actually move. Um, underestimating the share of load, especially between two cranes or more, can be a big issue. Wind, of course, is always a big issue, um, either ignoring the effects of it or underestimating them. Mechanical failure is far less common, actually, because yeah, decent companies should have um, their examination processes in place. Dynamic effects from moving cranes around, loads around, and suddenly releasing or applying the load can also cause cranes quite a lot of damage. So I'll show you a video of what happens. This was a, um, there's a couple of, couple of cranes here, obviously. The crane on the left-hand side, you might remember this, this is um, a crane accident in 2006 at Battersea Power Station that caused two fatalities. And obviously what you can see there is a tower crane, which is in effect upside down. Uh, what happened here was the, the, the people sent out to build the crane, the crane erectors, were given the wrong manual for the crane. It should have had seven tons of counterweight applied to the back of it. It had 12 tons of counterweight put on. Um, obviously in this case, the slew ring failed and the crane came toppling down and killed two people. Interestingly, this happened a period of time before with the, with the same crane. The fitters went out and they noticed that a couple of the slew ring bolts were broken. So they contacted the office, said, some slew ring bolts are broken, what do you want us to do? And the answer, unfortunately, was replace the slew bolts and put it back into service without trying to understand why they were breaking in the first place. Obviously, this time around, they didn't get away with it. The right-hand side, you know, Cranes can be big and small. This is, you know, genie lifts if you're, if you're familiar with them. And we had a project a couple of years ago where the genie lift started off like that at the start of the lift. And as soon as the lift started, it rolled forward on its, on its wheels and was only stopped by that pipe you can see in the background. It's actually quite a simple, simple thing they got wrong. As you're probably aware, these things have counterweights on them, as you can see with the, the red sort of steel weights at the back. The people using this weren't trained and they'd been moving it around site with the counterweights at the front, which made it easier to maneuver around on site. But of course, when they then got it to where they wanted it and wanted to start lifting, because they weren't trained, they hadn't read the manual, they forgot to move the counterweights back to the back of the, of the genie lift and that gave it no stability. So not properly set up. Um, this is a 500 ton crane and this is obviously not in the, in the sort of orientation that you'd expect to see it. What's, going to help, what's happened here is the operator is working in the yard. He's been asked to tidy up the yard, move things around, get them all in a sort of sensible, sensible order. And he's tried to get to a load, which is just outside of his rated capacity. So he's, he's trying to get to a load. It's beyond where the crane says, that is my limit. So what he's, what he's done is he's gone in and he's told the crane in the computer that it's got more counterweight on than it actually has. That's allowed him to do the lift, but of course the crane doesn't have the stability, even though it thinks it does. And this is where tricking the the RCI can be done. So an, an operator can go in. Cranes are, cranes are pretty crude pieces of equipment. They don't actually know what you've put on them. You, as an operator, you'd have to tell the crane what you've done. And so that leaves it open to abuse, um, either deliberate or accidental. So one of the things we look for is crane supervisors confirming that the crane has been set up correctly. Again, another small crane now, so we're looking at a pallet stacker. And um, we had a, a, a Brickies mate here who was asked to put the concrete blocks on the top lift of the scaffold. He had not been trained to use this pallet stacker and to try and make his life easier, he put as many blocks on it as he possibly could. So it's rated at just over a ton. He had approaching two tons on the pallet. 
He then turned the handle sideways, pulled the trigger to move it, and it went spinning around in circles. And as you can see, fell over. So fundamentally no training, but also being used above its rated capacity. And the dynamic effects caused it to fall over. And this is something which could or could not cause stability issues. But when, when you've got a crane, all crane booms naturally flex. It's just the way they're designed. So if you pick a load up and then the boom flexes, it will move the load out of the radius potentially that you were planning for. And it requires a bit of operator skill to keep it in the radius. If you were approaching 100% of your crane's capacity at that point, you could easily find yourself going beyond 100%. And it's also this movement that catches people out and knocks them off the ground. So if you've got people standing near loads, we have had accidents in the past where this has caused broken legs and things. So it's really crucially important people don't stand near loads when they're being picked up. I don't know if there's anybody on the phone, on the, on the call from Amy, but this was um, back in November. Amy would find £600,000 for this accident. So what we've got here is a, a, a rubber duck, rub, a wheeled excavator, which is capable of going on the rail. Obviously, it's got the special attachments. The, the planned lift, they're doing some rail replacement works, and the, the sections of rail were longer than they were expecting. So the, uh, because they're longer, they weighed more. The only way they could complete the work, and this is obviously done in a, in a blockade of the rail line, was to override the safety features to make it work beyond its rated capacity. And of course, that caused the excavator to fall over. So some of the things we can do about this, well, we're looking for people who are trained, assessed and competent. We're making sure lifts are planned, um, making sure they're communicated, planning the acceptable utilization of the cranes, making sure we know what the load weights are, making sure we know what the radius we're gonna to lift to is. And one of the things as a business we do is we make sure we don't go beyond set figures so we limit, we limit our appointed persons who plan our lifting to 85% of the equipment's capacity. And beyond that, it needs a higher level of sign-off. And when we, we go over 95, all the lift plans come to me for a, a peer review. And then it comes down to supervision on site, really, to make sure lift supervisors are checking equipment set up correctly and operators are competent and following the lift plan. This is a bit more of a subtle one. We had an accident on Bond Street Station on Crossrail where we were trying to remove a construction hoist from a lift shaft. And you can see on the left-hand side, that's what the subcontractor planned. And they showed us that they needed a beam with a load hanging vertically from it. So bottom left is their temporary works design. There's, there's the details of what they required. So a beam went in for them. It was fixed down. The fixings weren't done properly. They didn't put enough chemical anchor in them. They cross-threaded them. They didn't put them in straight. All these sorts of problems. Wasn't checked. Um, the beam failed during the first lift and went um, down the lift shaft and narrowly missed a guy who was stood on top of the hoist in the position you can see so it very nearly hit him and would almost certainly have killed him if it had hit him when we did the investigation it was actually very clear that they didn't want to do a vertical lift they wanted to lift on an angle and that would have required a very different design so it was not used as per the designer instructions because that wasn't communicated well enough and then it was not installed well enough either and what you find often is that these things are cascades of incidents and hopefully this is going to play so we'll see yeah so i suspect it's probably pretty obvious what caused that crane to fall over this is obviously ground conditions uh, it's quite a famous accident in new zealand that waikato bridge um at the top left there we've got a picture of the um, tower crane that collapsed in bow uh, a year or so ago now um unfortunately killing a person and that was down to ground conditions or likely down to ground conditions as well um obviously putting cranes on suspended slabs like you can see in the middle there be very very careful that, that really requires detailed assessment to make sure they don't um, punch through the slab 
And at the bottom there, we've got a, a near accident, if you like, on a costing site where luckily it was spotted in advance. But we've got a crane mat there trying to support the crane. And you can probably see that the stone doesn't go all the way underneath the crane because there are obstructions in the way. There's these little plinths and bits and pieces. So following the approved temporary works design for supporting the crane is crucially important and making sure we inspect it before use. So unsuitable ground conditions. If you have a look at that incident in New Zealand, this is what they started off with. It's a mangrove swamp on the side of a river. Um, the company involved are trying to put in a new bridge to support a cycle track alongside an existing road bridge. So what they've got is very, very soft, gloopy um, material, not really what you want to be building on. And what they did is they put a crane mat in, they, they got a load of stone in, put a mat in, did some rolling, as you saw. Um, before, the day of the, before the day of the lift, somebody came to site and said, the mat is too steep at the front. So can you do something about it? So they then put some more stone in, tried to slacken out the batter on the front and make it a little bit safer. On the day of the lift, obviously the crane's there, crane arrives on site. Um, what they found was they, they did a test lift of the, of the load and they found it was too heavy. So they took the, the uh, handrails off the edge of the bridge, tried to do another lift, still found it was too heavy. And the only way they could then lift it and get it within the capacity of the crane was to bring the crane forward onto that mat that they built over the past couple of days. And during the lift, as you saw, there was then a rotational failure of the mat. To, in, in the interest of trying to avoid a big prosecution, the, the company involved was very good and shared a lot of their investigation um, quite widely so people could learn from it. What they said was that in, individually, perhaps this is a bit of um, hindsight, but individually they all had concerns but thought as a group, somebody else is covering it. So they, you know, that sort of um, removed their concerns, if you like. They followed some industry standards in terms of mat thicknesses and compaction requirements, but in retrospect, say, well, this is not a standard location. Building on a mangrove swamp is not normal. Um, they had some geotechnical information, but it was from the other side of the river. They didn't do anything locally. And actually adding stone to, to the, the mat made the problem worse by putting more load on the ground in the first place. Obviously, moving the crane forward then because of the weight issues, um, that then resulted in the, in the incident. The bottom line was they didn't follow a systematic process to the management of temporary works. So by way of example, what would we do in the UK? Well, the first thing to do is identify the hazards on site, make sure we know what's in the ground, services, excavations, basements, voids, all these sorts of things. Make sure we know as far as we possibly can. Work out what the loads are from the crane, and that would be the responsibility of the appointed person ordinarily. But we can check that and just make sure that the numbers that we've been given are reasonable. Um, we then will have a design process. To, we'll record our requirements in a design brief. There might well be some more surveys carried out, and then somebody competent is going to have to do the design. And depending on the complexity of the design, a certain level of independent check will have to be done as well. You'd hopefully get some construction issue drawings at the back end of that. And then the important thing is to build as per the temporary works design and use an inspection and test plan to control and sign off the process of the compaction requirements, the thicknesses, the materials, all those sorts of things. Make sure you compact it as required and potentially test it at the end of that to make sure it doesn't settle. And then offer it back to the competent person and say, I've built what, you, what we needed. Can you come and check it? So generally you'll get then a permit to load from the temporary works coordinator. And the important thing for a, a lift in AP is to make sure you put the equipment where you said you were going to put it and support it as the temporary works coordinator said you must do on the mats, whatever it might be. And then not deviate from that because of course that can change the loading. And on, on, on an ongoing basis, then just make sure the mat is maintained. It doesn't get wet. It doesn't get dug through um, and all those sorts of things. So it sounds a pretty straightforward process really. So in, in the UK, obviously we followed BS5975 um, and that would be represented within company procedures. And all of those things there, are, are, you know, what I talked to you about before. So supervision on site, make sure you've got the crane you expected. Make sure you position installed as you expect. Make sure you do not exceed the load or radius that you've told the designer you would do. And make sure you maintain them out on an ongoing basis. Oh, God. Wow. 
Oops. So I'm sure you've probably seen that before, but there's, it's another one. It's another instant where there's a cascade of things. It's a typical Swiss cheese, if you like. They've got two cranes on barges which are narrow. The barges are, um, are tilting, as you can see. Both cranes are being used at 100% or greater than 100% capacity, which is, of course, not something you would recommend on any normal day. And they've also forgotten to allow for the flexing of the crane booms and the wind effects on the bridge section. They might have got away with one of those things or even two of them. But when you start adding all of these small things that they've forgotten to consider together, then you get a real problem. And it comes down to, obviously, the, the movement underneath the cranes. Uh, so what we do um, is when we're, when we're working on water, we, we're thinking about something called the metacentric height. And we're trying to work out, is the, the vessel that we're, um, we're using, is it stable? And the example on the left-hand side shows a stable barge where the centre of gravity is to the side of the centre of the buoyancy and it wants to turn it back to the left. But if you move the centre of gravity up and up and up, you get to a position where that doesn't happen anymore and the centre of gravity will beat the centre of buoyancy and it will want to turn over. So calculating these sorts of things is really, really important. And marine surveyors would do this. This would not be an appointed person's job. Um, ballasting of the barges is really important. It was forgotten about effectively in that crane accident before. Using really wide, flat vessels is much better than using really, um, really narrow, really deep vessels, as wide as possible, with the intention of trying to keep the centre of gravity as low as possible. And if you can do, use something called spud legs, which is you know, effectively tubes on the side of the barge, which go down into the riverbed and make it a stable platform. So another pretty famous accident there, um, Big Blue in America, 1999, um, resulted in the principal contractor Mitsubishi being fined um, just shy of $100 million and the crane supply being fined um, a couple of million dollars. Um, if you haven't seen that before, what, what you've got there is a crane which is capable of lifting about 500 tonnes being used at about 97% of its capacity. Just put it back on again and just leave it there a second. Um, so it's been used at about 97% of its capacity. Um, what the... Uh, what, what they've not really managed is the wind, as I'm sure, well, I'm not, not sure if it's obvious or not. Um, so because of the thing they're lifting is so big, it's got the aerodynamic effect of a, of a 747 wing. That's what the official inquiry found. And because of that, it pu puts enormous stress on the crane. So they should have in what, they, what they call derated the crane wind speed to, not, to limit the wind speed to a lower value than the manufacturer says is, is the limiting wind speed, if that makes sense. Um, so the limiting wind speed for this lift would have been 10 miles an hour and the crane's rated at 20 miles an hour. So a reduction, but not massive. But the problem, is, the problem they had was that it was costing the principal contractor a lot of money. This crane had been on site for a number of days. And because of the wind, the crane supervisor had prevented the lift from going ahead. So the principal contractor put pressure on the crane supplier to sack the crane supervisor. So he's off site and everybody else was then concerned about losing their jobs. And so allowed the lift to go ahead in wind speeds that they knew were not suitable. Um, on the day of the lift, the wind speed was round about 30, and I say round about because one of the findings of OSHA was that the principal contractor unplugged and deleted all of the wind speed monitoring before the investigation started. So they can only, uh, only really go off sort of local measurement. So use well in excess of both the rate of wind speed 
at high percentages of his capacity. And you can see, again, how these things build up. So that killed three people, two in a man riding basket and one inside the, um, one inside the stadium. This one you might not have seen, and it's not a great video. So what you can probably tell there, you've got a crane which has blown over in a sandstorm. Um, and the aftermath is obviously what's shown in the bottom picture. And that accident killed 111 people and injured 400. Um, this was 2015 in Mecca and Saudi Arabia. And the crane had been left rigged um, in the middle of the pilgrimage. And it had a very long boom on it. So the, when it blew over, obviously the crane boom went through the roof of the mosque. And that's why it killed so many people. So this is obviously this is all about wind being either ignored or underestimated. Um, I'll let this video go, but I'll just mute it because you don't really need the sound. Um, so to bear me a second. Right, there we go. So this this is the, the thing to think about is how you um, how you plan for out of service conditions. What you can see in the video there is a crane quite happily spinning around, and that is what is what it's designed to do when it's been put out of service because the wind speed is too high or um, it's the end of the shift. So this is spinning around quite happily. The other crane hasn't had its slew lock turned off, and so it's fixed rigid. And it doesn't fall over, but you can imagine the amount of strain that puts on the crane structure. So we're, we're thinking about planning, communicating lifts again, checking the forecast, making sure we've got an advanced forecast. What you can see in the flow chart there is the method that we have in the British standards for derating cranes to take account of the sail factor on them. And it, this allows you to identify which loads are sail loads and therefore what do I have to derate my crane to. Um, the crane that fell over at Mecca, the image you can see there of a crawler crane, I, I don't know, but I think the, probably the issue was they didn't have space to put the crane down. So if it's got a very long boom on a crawler crane, you can imagine the amount of space you need to safely lay that boom down on the ground. Perhaps they hadn't allowed for that, but it just fundamentally shouldn't have been there. So clear lines of responsibility, respect for roles is really important as well, um, particularly in that example before, when we've got a lift supervisor who is, he's, you know, he's, he's employed as a professional to do a job. Um, he's making professional decisions. They're absolutely the right decisions. It is not the position of management to obviously be overruling those and, and sacking people on that basis. Um, yeah, the, again, you might remember this. This was not that long ago. Um, this is a crane undergoing its test lifts in Rotterdam. Um, if it plays. Here we go. So I'll tell you what's happening. The, the crane is doing a test lift. So it's trying to lift a barge weighing 5,200 tons, I think it was. And it's got to 2,600 tons and the hook has snapped. And because it's, when, it, when you do a test lift, you, you, an overload test, you do it at short radius. That means if you suddenly release the load, you've got a crane that has the, um, the sort of tendency to flip back on itself, as has happened here. So mechanical failure, and there's not many of them, but that, that is one of them. Um, what can we do, I suppose? Well, we can inspect load attachment points, making sure they're suitable to use before, before we lift with them. Um, a hook is an accessory, but an, an integral attachment point on a load would not be um, a lifting accessory under loadless. We have to make sure we inspect them properly under pure. One of the things we find is that when we go and get things built by suppliers, often they don't know the right technical standard to use. Um, so they'll, they, you know, they'll, they'll do the best they can do, but they might not put the right factor of safety um, within the design to guard against mechanical failure. Obviously on site, we do things like non-destructive testing. Um, often we have to proof load test equipment. Not all equipment needs proof load testing, but especially things like tower cranes, um, permanently fixed gantry cranes, these sorts of things, they do need proof load testing when you first put them in place. So we need to make sure that any design that we're doing, any temporary works design, takes account of that overload test, which is generally done at 125%. Something else we can do is just make sure we're choosing the right type of equipment for the type of lifting we're doing. So you don't do piling works off telescopic mobile cranes, for example. Um, in terms of excavators, this was an accident we had uh, at Peterborough back in 2020. And you can see a draw pit there with some scaffold crushed. And I'll try and explain what happened. This is about dynamic effects from moving and not properly setting up the excavator. And I'm not sure how many of you um, are, are familiar with these sorts of things. So we're talking about wheeled excavators again. So it's picking up loads off the back of a lorry and putting them in the lay down area and they're um, earthwork support frames. So he's, his capacity at this point is about 2.66 tonnes. He's working at about 72%. And 
And what's shown there in the red dotted line is what we'd call this tipping line. So if, if the machine wants to tip, that's the sort of virtual line, if you like, around it would tip. So the first thing he does is he slews around and he brings the load onto the other side. So the tipping line moves across, still at 72%. He then wants to start moving with the load. And what he intended to do was move along with the load, slew it around, move it along at the same time, get down to the lay down area and put it back down again. One of the things to be mindful of here is that the duty charts for things like excavators are only for static duties. So the recommendation from the Construction Plant Hire Association is to half the duty charts. So at this point, in effect, he's at 144% of a safe working load. But you can see it went wrong. So why did it go wrong? So what happened was he started moving. Um, he got so far around. So he started moving and slewing, which, again, is not great. But what he forgot to, to recognise was that when he got to three kilometres an hour, the axle lock turned off on the on the excavator. And the axle lock, when it's on, keeps both axles rigid to the, to the chassis. When it's turned off, it allows one of them to articulate up and down to make sure that four wheels stay in contact with the ground. At that point, he hasn't, you can see where the tipping line's gone. He has no capacity, so it turned over. So when we think about lifting with excavators, this shows the configurations of just one individual model of, model of a, um, a rubber duck wheeled excavator. And actually, there's only one configuration you can do traveling duties in. So as in the point of person, it's really important to understand how equipment works. Um, if possible, choose better, more stable equipment, avoid traveling, make sure the ground conditions are right, apply D ratings to the duty charts. There's some other things that we do when we're traveling with excavators. Um, I, I have, I've got a little video here of a crane falling over. Um, and a video on the left hand side of, of cranes not falling over. So this is tandem lifting. This is when we use more than one crane at the same time. And the important thing to say is there's, there's fundamentally two different sorts of tandem lifting. The one on the left-hand side, you can see the load is really long. It, it could also be really, really heavy. So they need to mobilize two cranes to site to lift this load safely. What we often do with two cranes at the same time, though, is what you can see in the right-hand photo, which is bring loads in horizontally onto site and then top and tail them and stand them up vertically. So when we're doing tandem, tandem lifting or indeed using more than two cranes, um, there are some different considerations to think about. We need to know what each crane is taking. We have some options. We can size both cranes for 100% of the load. That would be an easy solution. Um, but if you could size both cranes for 100% of the load, why did you need a second crane on the left-hand picture, if you know what I mean? Um, we can use some rules of thumb to try and work out how much each crane might be taking. If the center of gravity is roughly in the middle, we think about 50%, and then we say, add another 50% for safety. And then we also say, we'll derate the crane to 70%. So we, we put in lots of rules of thumb. Um, Probably the better thing to do, which is what I'll show you on the left-hand side, is actually to, to work out what is the force on the crane at any one point. And I've just put some numbers in this just to show you what happens. And in the, the blue line is the, the crane at the top of the load if it's being rotated, and the orange line is the tailing crane. And you can see the loads stay about the same until about 80%, and all of a sudden it goes all onto the main crane and drops off straight away on the, on the tailing crane. But if you didn't intend to rotate it, so the picture on the left-hand side again, if you didn't want to rotate it and you wanted to lift it level, what would happen if you lifted it out at level? And actually, you can calculate that. Um, you've got to be very careful. This is why on the standards, the recommendation is to use similar types of lifting equipment when you're doing tandem lifting. Because if one hoists faster than the other, what will happen is the center of gravity will be shifted across the crane, which is hoisting faster. So you need to be able to control for that. In this scenario here, you can see, I, well, you might be able to tell, I've, I've said crane B's gone 200 mil higher than crane A. It's not an awful lot. And that's moved it to a 60% load share rather than 50 so if 200 was the limiting number, how would you monitor that? How would you make sure you didn't exceed it? So that's a bit of a whistle what makes cranes unstable. And then I thought about well, what makes loads unstable. And actually, a lot of these things are very similar. So you know, what affects one might affect the other. So things like the wind is often an issue. But when we're thinking about loads, we're thinking about central gravity, really, particularly central gravity above lifting points. That can give us some headaches. Um, dynamic effects, unintended rotation, creative mechanisms. Suppliers have a part to play in this, and you think back to CDM. Have our suppliers given us the best information they could have done? Not always. Of course, we do have mechanical failure. We have failure of lifting accessories, um, often because they're not being adequately protected during the lift. So this is a, an offshore lift, and what you might not be able to tell is actually that's a man riding basket. And this video goes on for about six minutes. Um, and in the end, the only way the crane driver can get that load within control um, after a few bangs against the side of the boat is actually to dunk them in the water, take the swing out of the system and pick them back up again.
And perhaps this is a bit of a specific example, but it is wind being underestimated or ignored. We, we do have this problem. Um, the, the controls are very similar to what they would be for the, the, the wind loading on the equipment itself. Um, we particularly have this problem when we're lifting offshore because the recommendation for uh, land-based lifting is not to exceed seven meters per second wind speed. But anybody who's ever stood on a beach knows that seven meters per second doesn't often happen when you're working out offshore. So thinking about um, the type of equipment, the type of man riding equipment, and, this, and the safety of the people becomes even more important. An example here of a, an accident we had with an excavator where or our subcontractor did and um, resulted in a fairly substantial fine from the HSE. Um, I've redacted it for obvious reasons, but what you can see is an, ex an excavator lift and a piling hammer trying to push in timber piles into a beach. And the, the, the job started with a three ton piling hammer, but the subcontractor soon found that actually they couldn't push the piles in. So they swapped it for a six ton piling hammer, which had the capacity to push the piles in. The machine had the capacity to, re to lift it up, but you can see it didn't have the capacity to get, or didn't have the height to get safely above the piling hammer. So a decision was made by the slinger to put the bucket back on. And we ordinarily, we completely ban lifting with buckets still present on the excavator, partly because of this. Um, so you can see what's happened. They, they, they put the bucket on the right way around to start with, still couldn't get high enough. So they put the bucket on um, back to front and then put the, the accessories over the top of it. I think you can probably assume, assume you know what happens next. The accessories break um, because it's on the sharp edge of the bucket. The piling hammer fell off. It landed on somebody and it crushed them on, it crushed them and held them underwater in a rising tide. Luckily, they didn't die, but you can understand why we got fined. So failure of lifting accessories because the competence of people, poor rigging. Um, some more recent examples here from YouTube. I don't know if you saw the one on the left-hand side in the rounds on LinkedIn before Christmas. Uh, but what you've got here is a crane which has fallen over and two cranes which are putting it upright again. So they're using some soft slings when it starts playing. They're using soft slings and they obviously haven't protected them. But what do you never do? You never walk under loads. And unfortunately, these two guys decided that that's what they would do. Obviously very, very lucky. And on the right hand side, the, the lifting point is either ripped off or the lifting accessories have failed. So failure of lifting accessories, poor rigging, the sling should be protected. It could be the accessories have been overloaded or the lifting point has failed. Some of the control measures are very similar here. Again, you know, we're talking about inspecting lifting points, using the, the accessories that we should be using as per the lift plan uh, and making sure that where we are using soft accessories and those sorts of things, we protect them from damage. But if they do get damaged, we quarantine them. And again, supervision out on site and never ever walk under a suspended load. It's the, the worst thing you can possibly do. So it's an excavator that's fallen down a shaft on the Hong Kong Metro. Um, the video is the same thing, but it's from a different angle, this one that's still loading. Uh, but what you can see is the excavator rotated in the slings. It actually, has quite a long time before it, between it dropping out of the slings and hitting the bottom, so it was quite a deep shaft. Luckily, they had a very good exclusion zone at the bottom, so nobody got hurt. Um, but the issue is center of gravity above the lifting points. It's outside the support base, and it turned over. And we had a very similar accident to, to this ourselves back in 2019, which I'll share a, bit, a little bit later. So you can see the load coming down. Um, what we've got on top is a fairly clever slinging arrangement, which allows the load to be picked up from the horizontal up to the vertical and share the load between all the anchors in, the, in this piece of concrete. But it's been brought down too quickly and you can see the crane's already on its limit. As it continues rotating, it's moving the center of gravity away from the crane. And they, they plan lifting slightly differently in America, this is California. And so they potentially were using more of the capacity than we would recommend using in Europe. But you can quite click, quickly see it's unintended rotation. I think probably because of the speed of the lift didn't help. And we, we've had a similar incident ourselves in the last couple of years where we were trying to lift these um, blower units into Mogden Sewage Works in London. We lifted a number in, in exactly the same way. This one ended up on its side. Why did that happen? You see the lifting arrangement here um, before it's put on the ground. You can see the beam here. 
what they've what the sling has done is he's taken a single sling taken it from a shackle threaded it through the shackle at the top and back down again so you can imagine this beam can just freely move backs and forwards it's a soft sling and you can see it's degloved the sling it's taken the protective cover off it caused a lot of embarrassment obviously cost quite a bit to to re repair as well um and delayed the program so this is we, we didn't really know where the center of gravity was that's what that clearly came out um the supplier didn't give us much help with that either it wasn't a great lift in terms of how it was rigged that was the wrong way of rigging it and we'd inadvertently created this mechanism whereby it was going to rotate in the slings and this, this is an example from from tideway thames tideway just i think mm, september october november i can't remember not fairly recently and what they're trying to do here is stand up a piece of stainless steel um it's part of the tube that goes into the the drop shafts into the sewer so an expensive piece of stainless steel is taking a long time to get on site. The supplier hasn't thought how they can help us lift this. So it's coming horizontally, been put on the ground. Now it need to lift it up vertically. And you can see it had been supported on a really narrow edge. We didn't really know where the center of gravity was. And so it's, it's predictable when you stand a load up like that, that, th that this will happen. Um, the center of gravity is no longer beaten by the friction on the ground. So it will rotate around. There was no damage to the crane in this case because the crane was only being used at about 20% of its capacity. As you can probably see, it's quite a large crane. So nothing worse happened than, than that, unfortunately, well, fortunately, but should never have happened in the first place. So suppliers have a part to play in this as well. Uh, this is another example of um, where suppliers have been really clear of what, what they wanted. And they've said, what we need to do is use four equalizing devices to make sure we, oh, sorry, two equalizing devices to make sure all the chains are equally loaded. And so that's what they're saying, use what we call snatch blocks either end of the beam to balance the load and when, when the load came up you can see it didn't come up horizontally um so luckily the site spotted this they stopped the lift and they found a different way of lifting it um but why did that not come up level so obviously unintended rotation there's a mechanism there that hasn't been defeated yet and the supplier hasn't helped us so th these are the sort of things that keep me awake at night obviously as an engineer um thinking about how to manage these sorts of problems it is a particular problem with precast um what you can see there is an image from the Halfen catalogue, familiar with Halfen, the anchor manufacturer. Think about this scenario in the, in, the, in the middle at the top. You're trying to lift something with four chains. Would you expect all four legs to be equally in tension? It's not going to happen. You're going to end up this sort of scenario where they bounce backwards and forwards between two legs are going to be always tight, and two legs are going to bounce back and backwards and forwards between tension and slack. So those are the sorts of scenarios where if the designer has assumed all the anchors are going to be equally used, we then have to put an equalizing device. The most simple way of doing that is the one at the, in the bottom at the middle, which is what we'd call an equalizing triangle. And that balances the load between the two legs, which are attached to the single leg. Something we can do as well is think about what did the designer actually allow for? If the designer has assumed four anchors, then they might well have assumed that each one takes 25% of the load. The reality would be each one takes 50% of the load if you don't put an equalizer in. The other thing to think about is what are we actually going to lift this with this? Sorry, what are we going to lift this with on site? Uh, the dynamic effects from the lifting equipment don't want to be underestimated. Something like a mobile crane, the factor of safety is recommended around about one to one and a half. An excavator, they recommend about four. If it's an excavator that's traveling, it's up to about six. So rather than taking 25% of the load, they might need to be designed to take 300% of the load. And failure of precast anchors is not uncommon, um, largely because of this underestimation of what each anchor is taking. So I was thinking back to the uh, bit of precast that we were trying to lift, and why did that happen? So we've got this arrangement where we've got a wheel at the top, which balances the force in the slings either side. Um, if you remember sort of how to how to calculate moments about a point, the moment on in this case, the moment on the left hand side is greater because it's further away from the center of gravity. So you end up with the moment to wanting to turn it over to the right, and as you turn it more to the right, that difference only gets greater. So this is going to um, this is going to accelerate in its failure, if you like. It's going to speed up as it turns around. And there's nothing you can do, unrecoverable. Um, but how can you get around this? Well, if you lower the center of gravity, actually you end up with a scenario where the moment on the right-hand side is greater than on the left-hand side, and it wants to bring itself upright again. And that happens when you get to this 90 degrees magical angle, if you like. So a lot of, uh, a lot of lifting is actually just maths, and it's just having the time and the space to to think through the numbers and try and think what would happen from a statics perspective. So that, that all right itself. Um, in terms of 
lifting points above the center of gravity. Of course, if you lift something like this, all that's going to happen is that the, the center of gravity will move underneath the hook. That's just obviously a fundamental way that gravity works and it will come up off level. And it, again, it's that movement that often catches people out and knocks them off their feet. So what would we try and do? We'll try and get the lifting points equally spaced around the center of gravity if you can. The left-hand side, technically feasible, but it's on the point of instability. It's not very sensible. So I said we dropped an excavator down the shaft at Tideway. Uh, here's the, the excavator in green here. And what you can see in panel 25 is a hilted drill stuck in the wall. So there were people drilling in the wall at the time that this excavator fell. Um, it caught the counterweight on the back of the cherry picker, took the chassis off the tracks, flicked the people out of the basket, some quite nasty injuries. So of course, the first question is, well, what on earth are people doing in there in the first place? Um, of course, that is the solution. Don't have people in the, in, in that area during the lift. Um, but from a stability perspective, I'll try and show you what, what went wrong. So the manufacturer said, here's the center of gravity. This is how you lift the machine. The supplier then put a bigger arm on the machine. So it's an eight ton machine fitted with a 13 ton arm. That obviously weighs more. That moves the center of gravity forward. Decision was made, wrong decision on site, obviously, um, to fit a breaker before it was lifted. Again, moves the center of gravity forward. So we've got a movement in the center of gravity from where the manufacturer says it was. As we're lifting it then, there's nothing to stop the slings moving in along the base of the chassis. And the only thing that will stop them is the rollers. And of course that then reduces the base of stability. We pick it up with a fairly fast moving gantry crane. When we stop, obviously the swing's still in the, in the system. The swing has to come out somewhere. It tips forward, center of gravity goes beyond the lifting point. At that point, it's gonna fall out of the slings. Obviously nothing you can do at that stage. So we'd look at the manufacturer's information to understand what they told us, if you like, in the planning stages. And that is the lifting method that we were proposing to use. There are other ones, as you can see there. But very importantly, in the second page, it says, this is only valid if this is a standard machine. And we knew we didn't have a standard machine because it had a bigger arm, bigger counterweight, um, a fox cage, a rocks cage, various bits and pieces. So we went back to the manufacturer and said, okay, well, we haven't got a standard machine. What's your advice? And it took about three or four weeks, which obviously if you're planning this lift isn't great. The advice came back and said, it's pretty much the same. It's, it's not a very easy way to plan a lift if the advice coming from the suppliers isn't great. So this is what the lifting arrangement looks like. And what you can see is there are the lifting points. They're not captive. They're just little stickers on the chassis that say lift from here. So it's a fairly narrow support, but if the slings move in, you end up in this scenario. It's even narrower. Um, this is the same machine used on a different site adjacent. And so they rigged, they, they rigged it up as they would lift it to show me how they were doing it. Um, and that is more or less as the manufacturer says, but they do say put the boom on the, on the ground. The site were telling me, no, we don't do that because if we do that, it tips out. So there was obviously a suspicion that it wasn't stable. And they said, actually, we don't lift it like this either. We rotate at 180 degrees because otherwise it's not stable. And so we, we found this in the investigation that we did. They'd done seven trial lifts that morning and every time I had to adjust it to try and get it stable. Clearly that should have been alarm bells and the lift should never have happened. So going forward, what we've done is we, we lift excavators now on what we call machine trays, where you can, you can put any piece of plant on it really. Um, you strap it down, it's much less likely to tip. Um, in terms of the excavator stability, this sort of scenario, that's always going to be stable because you can see the center of gravity is within the support line. That is on the point of instability. That is unstable. Unstable is probably better because you wouldn't be able to lift it in the first place. Of course, if you lifted something like this, what would happen? Very much like that previous one, it will move so the center of gravity is below the hook again. Um, so stability in that direction, the one I just showed you, is that's the easiest one to work out. It's this one which gives us a bit more of a headache. We have got some basic rules. If the angle of B is greater than the, ang is greater than the angle of A, that is always stable. It's the same as the height of B greater than the height of, ang of A. Always stable. So if we shorten the slings on top so that B is equal to A, that is on the point of instability. And if B is less than A, that is always unstable. And why that works? So if you think about the excavator hanging from its slings underneath the beam, all you're doing in effect is transferring the force from the beam down to the tracks. So let's take those out and move it back up again. And you can see the center of gravity now is within that triangle at the top. So that is stable. I'm not, not saying it's very stable, but that is stable. The reason that works, um, if we've got a, a, a small angle at the top, if we turn it a little bit to the right, you can see that the center of gravity has moved beyond the line of support. And so that wants to keep on turning. 
But if you have long slings at the top, i.e. a bigger angle at the top than at the bottom, turn it the same amount and the center of gravity stays on the other side, so it wants to turn it back again. So these, those rules are fairly easy to apply. If, if it gets more complicated, there are some more com complex ways of calculating it. And this is very similar to those um, the calculations you'd have to do for the stability of barges as well. So this isn't something you'd want to take on every day, but it gives you an idea that it can be done if you've got the time and the, the math skills to do it. So just by way of summary, and then I wrap up, um, we had some, we had, a, we had a spate of incidents about two or three years ago and tried to get to grips of well, what were the fundamental rules we always need to obey by. So those are the ones on the left-hand side. And what we, you know, the, the easy rules to follow are, you've got to make sure people are trained, competent, um, assessed as competent and appointed, make sure everything's planned and communicated, make sure exclusion zones are clear, never walk under suspended loads, never lift loads over people. Um, use push sticks or, or taglines to control loads from a safe distance. And then the other things that aren't really golden rules, but just things to think about. Make sure you've had a briefing, make sure you've checked the weather, make sure you know where the center of gravity is, make sure you maintain, inspect and examine your accessories. Make sure you inspect where you're attaching, make sure you look at the load path, um, do a trial lift, protect your accessories, really obvious things. Um, and just some basic rules down the bottom, like I said before, don't stand or walk under suspended loads. Don't put your fingers in crush locations and don't put yourself in a potential crush zone. So hopefully that was interesting, open to any questions at all. Fantastic, Thank fantastic you. Tom, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, right, got a couple of questions on the chat side of things. Uh, first one from Adrian, uh, I'd like to know, he asked this earlier on, uh, what information uh, do you like to see from designers? In the pre-construction information when they are detailed when they have detailed elements which will be reasonable sorry reasonably be assumed to be lifted um yeah it's a good question um defined lifting points is the easiest one so you know a, a drawing which shows you lift from here here and here um that it's given consideration to whether or not the load has to be rotated that can often be a, a, a bit of a stumbling block we've got some lifting points at the top four lifting points but the load has to be delivered horizontally how did they intend that that reorientation to work so from a designer's point of view i suppose how are we going to move it on site how are we going to reorientate it on site into the position we need it and have you asked the site the question of well, what type of equipment is going to be used to make sure that all those factors of safety um are built in things like, like i said before if you're using an excavator versus a mobile crane very different factor of safety to making sure there is that conversation about the intended lifting method Thank you very much. And the other question we've got there, are simulators, or are there any simulators to assist in pre-testing? Uh, there are. Um, then they're not widely sort of publicly available. Um, I'm, I'm thinking the question is about simulating lifts before they happen rather than sort of crane simulators, if you like. But there are, um, th th there's quite a few crane simulators now. The um, CITB, the Construction Industry, Industry Training Board, are kind of getting on board of simulators. So now you can you can actually be trained to drive a tower crane without actually ever having sat in a tower crane. You can get your your, your, your license to operate if you like. Um, in terms of simulation of actual lifts, most of the most of the um, software that does it is proprietary to the organisations that developed it. So one of the one of the companies that I know develops a lot of this is Mamut. That you're probably familiar with. Um, Mamut have a system for taking loads into a virtual reality space and simulating the lifts um, before they do them. But they do that as a selling point to clients you know, like ourselves. Um, but they don't make the software freely available on the open market for obvious reasons. I hope that kind of answers your question. I think that's what was being asked. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there any more questions from the floor? Yes, yeah, it's Adrian Shawcross here again. I, I asked a question about the um, uh, information from designers because um, I, I work for Rambol, so we, we, we work okay. on DMB projects and I'm, I'm trying to get our engineers to be much better at detailing information. Um, can, um, one, one of the things that sort of came up in discussion recently was about sort of identifying sensor gravity on, 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 on loads and um, in, in, on drawings. And is that something that you would actively encourage as well? Absolutely, yeah. We we have. I mean, if you lift something from above the um, center of gravity, it, it's inherently stable. Whether or not it comes up level, um, it's inherently stable. It's, it, 
the main issue is when we lift things from the bottom and the center of gravity is obviously above that. Um, knowing where it is then becomes critically important to understanding how we need to rig the chains. Do we need to shorten any chain legs and all those sorts of things to try and get it to come up level and make sure we don't have this instability issue. Um, so yeah, center of gravity would be really, really helpful. Um, load weight, very, very helpful. And uh, like I said before, the method of lifting, integrated lifting points, absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yes, I think, I mean, having worked on quite a lot of DMB projects, it's it's that interaction with the contractor that I really enjoy, um, mm. you know, to, to actually, you know, really, really get our designs sort of fine tuned. And, um, you know, I worked on a traditional contract recently and, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite unpleasant, really, because we just didn't have that engagement with the contractor. Yeah, the collaboration gone. Yeah, it's yeah, not great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Adrian. Any more questions, please? Take the silence means that there isn't any more. So, uh, Lance is getting ready to say something. No, no, I was only going to say, you know, just agree with you, but I think um, unless anyone's got anything more, I think, uh, you know, uh, we also thank Tom for a very uh, illuminating presentation. Uh, it's, it's certainly not a topic that I'm very familiar with, and I found it fascinating, actually. Good. Uh, and I hope everyone else that's joined in, we've had a very good attendance, which is uh, very encouraging indeed, you know, and uh, that was really good. So, so thank you, Tom, uh, Tom, certainly on my behalf. You're very welcome. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. Yeah, and if you if you want anything in future, obviously you've got my contact details. Feel, feel free to get in touch. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and, and definitely from, from my side of things, I used to teach lifting operations many, many years ago when I was in the RAF. Mm. Um, obviously aircraft engines and things like that and um, I've not done it since I left the military and um, so it's just yeah it brought it back to mind you know, nice to refresher think yeah. About. yeah definitely <laughs> yeah something yeah. that I totally forgot about to be honest or well, not forgot about but you know it's it's, it's in the grey matter just, just drifted away a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. 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 great yeah that's so good. yeah very informative really enjoyed that excellent that's been a pleasure no okay any more questions anyone going going Gone. Okay. Thank you very much, you. Tom. Much appreciated for your um, giving your time tonight. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Um, okay. I'll, I'll dip off now, so I'll leave you to okay. it. But no, thanks a lot, guys. Can you um, just record? Yeah. Uh, we'll be uh, circulating this amongst member uh, attendees, in due course. Yeah, so, so this recording will um, appear on YouTube. We've got um, three on there at the moment. Um, if if you'd like to. If you'd like the slides on their own, do let me know and I can send the slides through with links to the videos on YouTube so you can sort okay. of peruse well, it at we, your own time. If you can send those to Verona then. Uh, yeah, we'll do. Her details yeah. And then, then she can pass them on to, to us and we can, we can do that side of it. Yeah, okay. I'll do, I'll do that later in the week or early next week. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, final thing from me, we've got another presentation the second Thursday next month. Um, get off the top of my head, Verona, would you still here? I think she's gone, unless Lance can find it. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just say is um, tomorrow morning, you're more than likely to get a, a feedback survey through uh, through on your email addresses. So if you can complete that, please, that'd be much appreciated. And it'll help us as well as um, the upper echelon of IOS to, IOS to uh, see what we've done and, and, and what your actual thoughts on the presentation, et cetera, et cetera. You found it, Lance? No, I haven't, I'm afraid. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. It's on process safety. Ah, got it. Next month. I've got it now as well. Yeah. yeah. So for the second Thursday next month on process safety. Um, so if there's no more questions for anybody, I thank you for your attendance tonight and I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.